So, uh, stuff that I am going to talk about has to do with the economics of identity and group conflict and to give you a broad motivation for what I have in mind, just go through the one page from a lot of you must have read Bisham Sahani's Tamas, right? The novel or at least watch the in the serial version. Govind Nihalni is Govind Nihalni directed that uh, uh, TV film. So, anyway go through this and I will talk I will talk about why this is important. What what is the what was Tamas all about? It is basically has to do with the analysis of communal riots. The story is about pre partition riots in a small north Indian town basically it was Peshawar, Bisham Sahani and Bisham Sahani by the way was Balrat Sahani's younger brother right. So, bo both of them used to live in Peshawar at that time and uh, this is about how riots develop a momentum of their own communal riots. And the character Devdath who is who is talking to the to the statistics Babu basically the representative of the state in a post riot refugee camp. Devdath comes in and asks about numbers, how many people have died, how many people belongs to which community and wants an additional information, the economics of it. How many of them are poor, how many of them are rich and the statistics Babu's response is uh, why do you bring in rich and poor more generally why do you bring in economics into something that is to fight between Hindus and Muslims or Sikhs. And if this response is that it will tell you some additional uh, important aspects of the story. Now, that is basically very broadly speaking what I want to do. I want to discuss how there one can bring economics in a broad sense into group conflicts, group conflicts over identity factors and by identity or ethnicity I am going to use this very loose sense as any kind of non class division. So, whenever I use ethnicity or identity I am going to use it very loosely as as a shorthand for any kind of non class division that is politically salient. Depending on the special context it can be caste, it can be uh, ethnic groups, ethno linguistic groups, it can be religion, religious conflict, it can be racial conflict, anything other than class conflict right. So, if there is any sociologist among you do not jump me on this I know that there are very specific formal ways in which one defines these things I am just using it as a shorthand for any non class division the binary I will work with is class non class clear. So, what I want to do is see how various tools of economic analysis standard tools of economic analysis can be used to fruitfully make sense or study the analysis of ethnic conflict meaning non class conflicts across identity divides. Second important aspects of identity conflict can be explained in terms of how the economy economic base loosely speaking the economic base of, of the society is organized and second social conflict in turn may affect economic outcomes. So, first the first part is a technical issue the I want to show you how certain tools of standard tools of economic analysis can just be used to study these problems. Second I want to see how economics affects identity conflict and then I want to close the circle I want to see how identity conflict might in turn affect the economy. So, in a sense it is a 
economy society interaction that I want to look at and if you like I want to look at the dialectical relationship between the economy and ideology but of course the kind of language that I'll be using the kind of tools I'll be using is very very mainstream standard neoclassical thing so yeah I will slip occasionally into Marxian phraseology it just used a base superstructure dichotomy I just use dialectics but the tools that I'm going to use will be very very ma uh, neoclassical mainstream okay so I'm going to ask non-traditional questions using very traditional standard tools of economic analysis and hopefully I will uh, I will end up by convincing you that there is a lot of scope for fruitful interaction between these different kinds of <laughs> kinds of modes of analysis right reading list you already have the reading list and you already have the papers right I've sent you all the papers so for a, I'll start with just a basic <coughs> model of analysis of conflict in a complete abstract setting so these are the basic readings in that literature so I'll discuss that and then I'll spend the rest of the of the my lecture on uh, talking about specific applications to different kinds of group conflict identity conflict in particular contexts. So uh, we have till uh, what 130 in the first session right so I'll, I'll, I'll try to first uh, spend the first session talking about the general model of conflict and then in the second session I'll talk about some aspects of uh, applications to ethnic conflict per se. In terms of the readings in the second bit you'll notice that I've, I have referred to a lot of my own work well um, partly because I am working on these things and like every other researcher the problems I'm working on seem the most interesting to me <laughs> but but if, if you will forgive that that level of of uh, self obsession the thing is um, a lot of this is uh, recent work it's frontier work papers are coming out even last year so this is frontier work and uh, the papers will also give you detailed entry points into the literature so so you, you can just use these as a launch pad for further entry into the literature okay any questions at this stage let's start with the simplest way of analyzing formally the process of conflict and what we start with is a very standard model of what's called rent seeking behavior what's the idea here the basic idea is the following you have a given amount of resources right? this resource think of it completely generally it can be can be material resources it can be uh, petroleum uh, uh, petroleum mines it can be diamond mines a lot of civil wars in Africa have to do with fights over diamond mines timber there is a lot of mafia conflict going on all over the world uh, uh, over access to forest resources whatever be the nature of the resource it's just given out there that is you don't actually have to produce this resource it's just out there for the taking all you have to do is just go and take it and that's costless okay that's what defines a rent seeking model from another kind of model that we'll see in a minute so there is some amount of resource there which is called that R bar so that's the value of this R bar let's say there is just a whole bunch of diamonds just lying around and that's your R, R upper bar there are two groups players A and B think of these as individuals groups at this stage it does not matter so there are two groups or two players A and B each of these players has some amount of secure resources that is resources over which there is no conflict so this is a, a story of 
partial enforcement of property rights. You are in a world where some part of your property rights are not contested over. I can defend that costlessly. That's R sub A and R sub B. But there is also some amount, some resource over which property rights are disputed. They have to be endogenously enforced. Okay. The how do the players do this? That's the next step of the model in any kind of conflict model then. Once you have defined the stuff that you are fighting over, next thing you define is the technology of conflict. What, I, what do I mean? How exactly is it that conflict is salient as an economic activity? Well, what do we study in our undergraduate uh, textbooks? Economics is about producing, consuming, how do you con uh, distributing. Now, how do you ultimately consume? Well, either you produce stuff yourself or you exchange something, right? But there is of course a third way in which you can get stuff, right? You can steal, you can rob. That is what we are focusing on. The, this whole literature is about the third way of acquiring resources, that is expropriation. That is an economic activity as much as production. Why? Because in order to expropriate, you need to spend real resources. You got to buy guns, you got to uh, spend time stealing things or robbing people, you got to uh, civil war, you got to set up an army. All of, all of this is just like running a factory. It requires real resources. So, if that is the case, then just like in the case of production, I need to specify a production technology, production function defining, specifying how resources are converted into stuff, things that one can actually consume or exchange. I need a similar step here in the modeling process, specifying how resource allocation on my part leads to my getting some stuff, resources. And that is called the in the literature, the formal name for that is a contest success function. Okay. So, which just defines how a given amount of resource generates some success in the conflict by giving you some resource. So, to do that, I need an input, just like in production, I need some kind of material input. In conflict fighting, I also need an input. So, this m sub a and m sub b are the units of their respective secure resources. This can be money, you use this to buy guns. This can be effort, you have some time and instead of you just use this time to, you could either use this time as leisure or you use this time to fight other people. Right? So, that is m sub a, m sub b. I am deliberately working with the simplest model, so it is just a one input one input model of conflict production. Obviously, generalization, you can have uh, production technology as military goods are produced with all kinds of different inputs, does not matter. So, this is used to fight over disputed goods, resources. So, each unit that is diverted is diverted from consumption. So, in that sense, it is a waste. right? And uh, for simplicity, each diverted unit generates one unit of military goods and fighting destroys some proportion delta of the disputed resources. So, fighting is costly. Again, this is just to make this makes a model realistic, but nothing is lost by assuming that delta is uh, 0. The fighting does not destroy any of the resources, it does not really matter. So, So, I have defined the inputs into the conflict process. Now, the production technology. The simplest way to define 
success in production is in through that thing. This tells you that the share of the resource that is being fought over that goes to A, P sub A, that is simply the ratio intuitively of the military expenditure by A and the total military expenditure by other people normalized by some relative efficiency Z. So, Z is a parameter which captures the efficiency with which the relative efficiency with which B can convert her military expenditure to units of e military expenditure of A. So, if B is let us say doubly efficient than A in converting one gun into military efficiency, right? then z is just 2. So, so, z is that parameter and the simplest case z will just be equal to 1. So, nobody has any relative advantage, they are all equal. But that is that's the, this is in, sorry. terms of shares, where you are fighting over some divisible good diamonds in my example. So, let us say that there are 10 diamonds and maybe uh, whether I get 5 diamonds, I can I get 5 diamonds, you get 5 if the ratio is like half. Okay. Or the another interpretation is and this is used typically for indivisible resources is the probability. So, you have risk averse, as you have risk neutral agents and this is simply the probability with which an agent or one player or one group can get the prize, right. Palestinians and Israelis fighting over Jerusalem, indivis indivisible resource, especially because where the fight is all, all about the really holy parts of the parts of Jerusalem which are holy to both Muslims and, and uh, Jews. So, they are very close together. You cannot really split up Jerusalem like that. So, indivis indivisible resource. Okay. In which case, this is probability. And so long as you assume that the agents are risk neutral, it does not matter. I mean, we know that is right. Whether it is shared income or it is uh, probability, does not matter. So, that is the simplest contest success function. And of course, this is the form it takes if the total amount of resource spent on fighting is positive. That is, if there is some fighting in the economy. If there is no fighting, then we will just assume that the it is divided in equal proportion. You can even assume that if it is if there is no fighting, it is divided in the proportion 1 over 1 plus z does not matter, it is there are different ways of specifying what happens if, if there is no fighting. The reason it does not really matter is in these kinds of models, no fighting typically will never be an equilibrium. Okay. You will never, never get no fighting as an equilibrium outcome and why that is the case will become clear in a minute. But uh, so, that is your second step, your conflict success function. Now, just look at the net resource that are the payoffs, the net resource that the uh, the players get. What is that? That is the resource that I started out with, right, R sub i. And with some probability or with some share P sub i, I get the R upper bar is the amount that is being fought over. So, and delta proportion of that is destroyed in fighting. So, I end up with this is what I get of the share of the uh, rent minus the military expenditure. Clear? So, now you got to solve the model. What happens with conflict outcomes? 
typically the or the simplest way to formalize this uh, structure the sequence of moves is in terms of a simultaneous move game. You can also have a sequential move game where one party moves first and the next the other one moves later, but that requires some particular assumptions about the nature of the fight something has to be something has to be there in the story to justify why one party has a timing advantage. I want to keep the model absolutely symmetric. So, assume that the players choose their military deployment simultaneously. Two mafia groups decide how many guns to buy simultaneously. So, you have a basically a Kuno game, right? Nothing but a Kuno game. So, each player maximizes their, their payoff, which I have already defined for the game. That is your first order condition and I am just going to leave this to you as an exercise. Absolutely straightforward, solve the first order condition and this will be your equilibrium military deployments. Once you get the equilibrium military deployments, just plug those into your payoff functions and you get your equilibrium payoff and also I know the contest success function the shares are given by the relative military expenditure right plug plug in the equilibrium values you get the equilibrium shares divisions so i have solved the model are we all clear so far as to the technicality of this all right so uh, that's a, that's a technicality now what do i get first notice that despite differences in military efficiency remember that z that relative military effectiveness parameter that uh, need not be identical right but despite differences in military effectiveness military resource deployments are identical in equilibrium and that happens simply because the marginal cost of deploying resources is the same. The marginal cost of deploying resources is just one, one rupee, it is a rupee for rupee deployment that is the same for everybody. So, the military resource deployments are identical. More interestingly, I want to know what happens with to conflict as the groups become more asymmetric in their ability to fight. First of all, how do I measure why am I interested in conflict? Because the, amount, the resources that are used in conflict, these are they, they do not produce anything, right? They, they are neither consumed not produced directly. So, in a world where I could just somehow from outside enforce the share that was going to happen as a consequence of the conflict, let us say that after fighting we all got uh, equal shares, right. Now, suppose there was some kind of omniscient, omnipotent uh, entity God. God just somehow gives us equal shares without any fighting. What happens? Well, the resources that were used up in fighting, those are saved and that additional resource then can be used for consumption. So, what is the why are we uh, interested in fighting? Because of this social loss and what is the measure of social loss or the cost of fighting, the simplest way to do it is in terms of the departure from the maximum possible output that could have happened, right. So, how do I measure this in this simple model? Just the sum of the military resources. In this model, there is no difference between final consumption good and the military resource. So, what is the wastage? due to conflict is just the total amount of military expenditure. So, what am I interested in at a policy level? I want to see how 
power between combatants. Good. Now, good for society in what sense? Suppose that all I am interested in is reducing conflict. That is reducing the total resource, total wastage due to conflict, which is nothing but the total military expenditure. Then, turns out that the there is an inverse u relationship between conflict and the parameter capturing relative power relative conflict efficiency z as z increases from 0 till 1 conflict increases and then as z increases further beyond 1 conflict falls meaning what start with a scenario where one group is like infinitely more powerful than another. Okay? That is actually the best thing for social peace, because the other, other party is so weak that the other party is not going to Im, uh, deploy any significant amount, it will never be 0, but the other party will never, de will not deploy any significant amount of resources in fighting. But knowing that the more powerful party will also not deploy particularly high amounts of resources in fighting. So, aggregate totals, uh, total uh, social loss will be low. Now, suppose the weaker guy becomes a bit more powerful. What is going to happen is the weaker guy is now going to deploy a higher amount of military resources, because the marginal effectiveness of military resources has become higher. But in response then, and, and I want you guys to actually work this out, all these partial, uh, the signs of the partial derivatives need to be actually calculated. So, work, it, work this out, it is it's straightforward derivation, but work this out. So, starting from this initial level where the stronger guy is very strong, if the weaker guy becomes a bit stronger, the relative asymmet the asymmetry falls a bit, then the weaker guy spends more, but in response the stronger guy also spends more. So, total expenditure goes up and this happens all the way till the two are evenly matched. So, that is when total conflict is maximized. What happens if uh, z moves beyond 1? Well, it is just the mirror image, right? Then it is the, the, the party which was weaker earlier now becomes the stronger and now exactly the same thing happens all over again. So, you get this inverted u business. So, what is that telling you? Well, if you want to minimize conflict or at least reduce social conflict, social policy, if you can, you should really make sure that one party is has some kind of power hegemony. Okay? Why is that socially optimal? It is socially optimal in a very specific sense. It is socially optimal in a sense that it minimizes or, or depending on where you put the z, lower z reduces the level of aggregate loss, social loss. In that sense, it is efficiency improving. What is the cost to increasing z or changing or moving z away from 1? And again, you should check this. As you move z further and further away from 1, the relative shares of the rent going to the different parties that that becomes more and more unequal and that should be intuitive right if there is greater asymmetry in power relations then there should be greater asymmetry in success yeah so, uh, the asymmetry means uh, not centrally planned so there is no central plan the natural outcome would be that one would be a uh, stronger well, it's not central plan because there there is no third party in my model yet right but in principle there could be one 
Suppose, suppose, there, suppose there is a government who is kind of sitting there or, or, a, or a third country. UN. UN. US. US sitting there and trying to. No, the, uh, uh, this is a story of a civil war, Syria, you have two parties fighting, the US decides to support one party rather than the other, Z changes. So one can be a central planner. Yeah, central planner, and, uh, I don't want to use the word, because, yeah, 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 because that requires all kinds of informational requirements, a third party who can influence Z, right. Just think of it as, let's say the, suppose you can't uh, buy heavy artillery on the market. So the amount of heavy artillery is a restricted resource. So Z just captures the amount of heavy artillery that you have. The more guns you have, heavy guns, the more efficient you are in, uh, the more higher the efficient military efficiency of the soldiers that you put, that kind of story. Is equal to one, where the two parties are equally equal. And the conflict will be higher. Conflict will be higher. The equilibrium will be uh, in the initial stages because to get to the other end, you have to go through the conflict. The other no, the not the equilibrium. The equilibrium is just once you decide on once you give me a z in the model, the equilibrium is automatically determined by that z, right? It's a comparative static story. You have an equilibrium. Now, what happens if there is an exogenous change in Z? How does the equilibrium change? So, for each given level of Z, you have an equilibrium level of conflict, total conflict. That increases as you increase Z from 0 all the way to 1. So, this is your, do you want me to draw it or is it clear to everybody? Ah, so, you increase Z, conflict also increases, got a positive slope. Till Z reaches 1, conflict is maxed. Then you increase z further. It's just like the other thing, right? The the flip side of the story. And z will be changing in time. It may, it 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 may not. The story behind changing in z is something I'm not formally modeling yet. I will, but not yet. It could be. It could be, but that story is not there in the model yet. I am taking this, as of now I am taking this as an exogenous variable and just asking, want to see, I want to figure out what happens if z somehow changes. Why it is going to change, how it changes is something I have not modeled yet. Okay? It is a comparative static yeah. exercise. It is a given that is that I am changing according to some, some rule that I do not know about. But my question is, if I have, let us say, two different societies which are otherwise identical, identical conflict, but different z's. How would the outcomes be different? But sir, can the z be endogenous to the model? Give me 20 minutes, not even 20 minutes, 10 minutes. It is exactly what I will go into. Okay? Sir, uh, just, just a sec. Let me just, just finish this chain of thought. So, what you are getting is a trade off. That is, if you value equality in the division of the resource that is being fought over, then you would like a z that is less asymmetric. The more equal the z, the more equal the outcome of fighting, right? And therefore, the more equal the income distribution. But the more equal the z, the greater the social loss to fighting. So, in some sense, there is this again, you see this all the time, right? This so called conflict between equity and efficiency. Same damn thing is happening here. If you have a social welfare function which, which is only interested in efficiency, that is, it is a utilitarian social welfare function. What is a utilitarian social welfare function in this context? Is it will be just the aggregate payoff, right? A utilitarian social welfare function is a general, uh, general functional form where you just aggregate the utilities of the or the payoffs of the individual uh, individuals. 
here the payoffs are just the total incomes. You just add the total incomes. So maximizing a utilitarian social welfare function will just be equivalent to minimizing conflict loss. I don't care about distribution. On the other hand, if you have a Rawlsian social welfare function, uh, Ochin, did Ochin discuss all these things? Uh, you're supposed to, okay, anyway. So Rawlsian is the uh, sort of the max inequality aversion you can get. All you are interested in is the welfare of the worst off person in society. In my case then, the, uh, that kind of a social welfare function will tell me that a social welfare is maximized by equalizing the outcome. In which case, I would like to maximize conflict. Z, z equal to 1, it's best for me even though it maximizes conflict because it gives me the most equal outcome. And you have things in between. Yeah, you had a question. Okay. All right. Huh. Shashwat. Uh, more equality would also not uh, put this thought in the minds of both the groups that you know since we are more equal, you know, comparable, the uh, outcome is only too much of blood loss and not really possible. Possible. That that would involve a dynamic formulation. Right. What you have in mind is essentially a repeated game. The problem with the repeated game formulation is here as always. At one level, you see, you have all these folk theorems, right? Which folk theorems tell you how to sustain cooperation over an infinite horizon as a perfect equilibrium. What do folk, how do folk theorems work? Folk theorems basically tell you that it's it's possible to sustain cooperation so long as you value the future strongly enough because then I can threaten to really hit you in response to a, a deviation and that is going to cost you and that cost will be very high if you uh, the higher the higher you value the future. So, first problem with folk theorems is that they depend very heavily on this high on, on my discounting the future, uh, my discount factor being pretty high. Okay. That is, I should value the future highly enough. And uh, if I do not value the future highly enough, then everything collapses. Second, it all depends on an infinite horizon model. If you have a finite horizon model, does not matter how many times you repeat the game, it is still, it is you can still not sustain cooperation as a sub game perfect equilibrium. Okay? Because what happens is it is always optimal for me to deviate in the last period. Now, you can see then extend the logic if it is optimal for me to deviate in the last period, should be optimal for me to deviate in the, the previous penultimate period, every damn thing unravels. You can sustain it as a Nash equilibrium, but not as a sub game perfect equilibrium. So that is why person, I mean, there is a huge amount of work has gone into this, this folk theorem, sustaining cooperation. But the, I personally, I am rather skeptical about whether, how, to what extent cooperation really works out because of these threats uh, in most, uh, these threats of a infinite future uh, in practice. Okay, so that. Nuclear power is a different story. Nuclear, the problem with nuclear power is also this delta is extremely high. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and it's a, a nuclear power. There's a lot of this stuff actually. Game theoretic stuff actually came out of the Cold War, uh, and uh, nuclear conflicts really played a big role. But uh, nuclear power is a very extreme kind of case, you know, so. Here we are more talking about ins incessant, low intensity, continuing conflict. So I hesitate to develop the intuition with a nuclear war story here. The other, but but yeah, I mean that's intuitive. But the other problem with uh, uh, with uh, dynamic uh, 
infinitely repeated horizon model sustaining pieces, I can just turn the question upside down. Why do we have why do we observe fighting then? Right? It tells you that there is a failure, uh, a some kind of market failure going on somewhere. So, I am just uh, looking at the scenarios where endogenous enforcement of pieces does not happen as an equilibrium outcome. Okay. And sorry, just, just one thing, let me just finish this line of thought. The third way to look at, look at this is, you have peace, but peace comes about as a process of negotiation. Think of this formally as the outcome being given by a cooperative bargaining model, where the outcome is always efficient. We just sit down together and work out an efficient outcome, we work, work out a share. But how do we split the available resources? That depends on what is called our outside options. Basically, what each of us can do ensure on our own if we walk out of the negotiation table. Right? Now, what can we ensure when we walk out of the negotiation table? Basically, what we can get by fighting. So, these Nash equilibrium outcomes, non cooperative Nash equilibrium outcomes, can alternatively be thought of as the outside options. My threat points. This is, this is also called threat points. So, you do not see conflict, but we all make this mental calculation that suppose we walked out of the negotiation table, this is what we were going to get. So, the keeping this in mind, we split the rent proportionate to what we were going to get in the in, in the non cooperative game. Okay? That, is, that is another way of modeling this. But, uh, but then that is another, uh, even though do we do not have conflict as such, we are still interested in what happens to the conflict outcomes, because those will determine our mental calculations, our negotiations. So, that is another way to think of this. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Standard rationality assumption. Uh, I, do, I do not want to get into that right now, because this is the simplest story. I have full information. Everybody knows everything else. I have um, a story of uh, standard common knowledge assumption in game theory. I, th I am rational in the sense I want to do the best I can. You are rational. I know that you are rational. Uh, you know that, I know that you are rational. I know that you know that you know that I know that you are rational and that, that is and you go on. That is the standard notion of common knowledge in game theory. So, that is all I, I want to work with at this stage. This information, information uh, asymmetries and all that will just make conflict more likely. Okay? They would not add anything crucial to the story. Sir, as mm. No, 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 no. If one player, uh, uh, if that's that's all there is to it. Notice that there is no winning or losing the losing story here. There, there is a probability which will never be won. Probability of winning will never be won. Nor will the share be ne, share will never be won in equilibrium. I'll always get. I always expect to get something. Maybe low. Maybe low. If it's very low. Then, okay, I see. I see a problem. No, no, no. I see. I see a problem. And that, let, yeah. A, a, no, no, no. It can be. Ra it, it can be rational. It's a different. I'll have a different response. Suppose I don't fight. Then, what's your best response? Knowing that I will not fight, your best response is to reduce your military con uh, country, military expenditure to an infinitesimally small level and then you get the whole thing. But if you reduce your military expenditure to an infinitesimally small level, my best response cannot be not to fight. Right? You are spending 1 rupee, but why do not I spend 2 rupees and get the whole damn thing? That is why you can never have one party not fighting in as an equilibrium outcome in these models. 
okay that is that is a better better response to your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Z can't be zero. Z it's a relative. Uh, it's a. Yeah. Sustain cooperation over an infinite horizon is have been perfect equilibrium. What do folk? How do folk theorems work? Folk theorems basically tell you that it's it is possible to sustain cooperation so long as you value the future strongly enough, because then I can threaten to really hit you in response to a, a deviation and that is going to cost you and that cost will be very high if you uh, the higher the higher you value the future. So, first problem with folk theorems is that they depend very heavily on this high on, on my discounting the future uh, my discount factor being pretty high. Okay. That is I should value the future highly enough and uh, if I do not value the future highly enough then everything collapses. Second it all depends on an infinite horizon model if you have a finite horizon model does not matter how many times you repeat the game, it is still it is you can still not sustain cooperation as a sub game perfect equilibrium. Okay. Because what happens is it is always optimal for me to deviate in the last period. Now, you can see then extend the logic if it is optimal for me to deviate in the last period should be optimal for me to deviate in the, the previous penultimate period every damn thing unravels. You can sustain it as a Nash equilibrium, but not as a sub game perfect equilibrium. So, that is why person, I mean, there is a huge amount of work has gone into this, this folk theorem sustaining cooperation. But the, I personally, I am rather skeptical about whether how to what extent cooperation really works out because of these threats uh, in most uh, this threats of a infinite future. Uh, in practice, okay. So, so that nuclear power is a different story. Nuclear, the problem with nuclear power is also this delta is extremely high. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and it's a nuclear power. There's a lot of this stuff actually. Game theoretic stuff actually came out of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, nuclear conflicts really played a big role, but uh, nuclear power is a very extreme kind of case, you know. So, here we are more talking about ins incessant low intensity continuing conflict. So, I hesitate to develop the intuition with a nuclear war story here. The other, but, but yeah, I mean that is intuitive, but the other problem with uh, uh, with uh, dynamic infinitely repeated horizon model sustaining pieces, I can just turn the question upside down. Why do we have? Why do we observe fighting then? Right? It tells you that there is a failure, uh, a some kind of market failure going on somewhere. So. I am just uh, looking at the scenarios where endogenous enforcement of pieces does not happen as an equilibrium outcome. Okay. And sorry, just, just one thing, let me just finish this line of thought. The third way to look at, look at this is you have peace, but peace comes about as a process of negotiation. Think of this formally as the outcome being given by a cooperative bargaining model where the outcome is always efficient. We just sit down together and work out an efficient outcome, we work, work out a share. But how do we split the available resources? That depends on what is called our outside options. Basically what each of us can do ensure on our own if we walk out of the negotiation table. Right? Now what can we ensure when we walk out of the negotiation table? Basically, what we can get by fighting. 
So, these Nash equilibrium outcomes, non cooperative Nash equilibrium outcomes, can alternatively be thought of as the outside options. My threat points, these are also called threat points. So, you do not see conflict, but we all make this mental calculation that suppose we walked out of the negotiation table, this is what we were going to get. So, the keeping this in mind, we split the rent proportionate to what we were going to get in the in, in the non cooperative game. Okay? That, is, that is another way of modeling this, but, uh, but then that is another uh, even though we do not have conflict as such, we are still interested in what happens to the conflict outcomes, because those will determine our mental calculations, our negotiations. That is another way to think of this. Okay. Yeah. Standard rationality assumption. Uh, I, do, I do not want to get into that right now, because this is the simplest story. I have full information, everybody knows everything else. I have um, a story of uh, standard common knowledge assumption in game theory. I, th I am rational in the sense I want to do the best I can, you are rational, I know that you are rational. Uh, you know that, I know that you are rational, I know that you know that you know that I know that you are rational and that, that is and you go on, that is the standard notion of common knowledge in game theory. So, that is all I, I want to work with at this stage, this information, information uh, asymmetries and all that will just make conflict more likely, okay. they would not add anything crucial to the story. Sir, as mm. No, 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 no. If one player, uh, uh, if that's that's all there is to it. Notice that there is no winning or losing the losing story here. There, there is a probability which will never be one. Probability of winning will never be one. Nor will the share be ne, share will never be one in equilibrium. I'll always get. I always expect to get something. Maybe low. Maybe low. If it's very low. Then, okay, I see. I see a problem. No, no, no. I see. I see a problem. And that, le, yeah. A, a, no, no, no. It can be. Ra, it, it can be rational. It's a different. I'll have a different response. Suppose I don't fight. Then, what's your best response? Knowing that I will not fight, your best response is to reduce your military con, uh, country, military expenditure to an infinitesimally small level and then you get the whole thing. But if you reduce your military expenditure to an infinitesimally small level, my best response cannot be not to fight, right. You are spending 1 rupee, but why do not I spend 2 rupees and get the whole damn thing. That is why you can never have one party not fighting in as an equilibrium outcome in this model. Okay? That is that is a better better response to your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Z can't be zero. Z it's a relative. Uh, it's a. Yeah. The Rawlsian social welfare function is the extreme egalitarian one. Nothing matters except for the welfare of the worst of person. Now, now you have a general, general concave utilitarian function where you, you sum the welfare, individual payoffs, but you uh, add a, for the marginal social benefit from additional welfare to one party is decreasing. So it's there is a concavity assumption built in that makes it the social welfare function inequality averse. I mean, I, I'm getting becoming unnecessarily technical. Sorry. All you need to do is you have this whole family of social welfare functions in between, where 
you can put more equal more weightage on efficiency rather than equality and the more weightage on efficiency the closer to one uh, the more weightage on efficiency the closer to zero or infinity that your optimal c will be clear any other question all right Next major insight that we get this trade off between welfare uh, equality and efficiency and uh, The next thing is what's, what turns up in the literature or a lot, it is called the paradox of power. Notice that when the players are equally efficient in their military technologies, z is equal to 1, the gains are identical. The gains from fighting are identical, even though one player can be far richer than another. So, initial advantage in terms of resource endowment is not reflected in conflict advantage and that is happening essentially because there is no channel through which this initial advantage in resources can get reflected in conflict, conflict efficiency. In fact, there typically there will be scenarios where the poorer you are, the more efficient you are in fighting. That 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 is that can be because your valuation of the gains from gains from uh, fighting are higher. In a more general model, which we'll see in a bit, your cost of fighting will be lower. So, if you are richer, that's because typically you are more productive if you are more productive, then you would much rather be producing than fighting. That is a better, that is a more productive use of your resources. The way then, then and this is the first set of extensions that you can think of if you want to work in this area. You can think of channels through which initial endowment can actually increase your fighting efficiency. One obvious channel is credit. If you have more initial resources, Think of a credit market which is which is not which is imperfectly uh, uh, which functions imperfectly. So for standard reasons, how much credit you can get or the interest rate that you pay on credit, that is higher the lower your initial resources collateral, basically a collateral story. But if that's the case, then if your military resources have to be funded through borrowed money, poorer people play a pay a higher interest rate. Therefore, their Z, their relative ability to fight is lower. So, credit channels, credit market processes could be one way to extend this story into having a link between initial endowments and and um, and fighting. So, without those kinds of story, you have what you, are, you have this paradox of power turning up. Typically, the poorer groups will be better of fighting. Okay, and the intuition will be that for poorer people, the cost of fighting is lower, or at least not higher than that of the richer people. So. This again brings us to this trade off between equity and efficiency. Fighting is actually good in a way, in a world where you cannot otherwise generate a, a relatively egalitarian outcome. And suppose if for whatever reason you value equality, then you might be willing to tolerate some equality because the outcome of fighting is usually more equal than the outcome of peace. Clear. The outcome when groups fight is typically more equal than the initial income distribution. 
or or you start with an initial income distribution that is unequal and you have this kind of fighting, the overall outcome or, or the outcome from fighting will be more equal than that from the initial distribution. So, that fighting will actually equalize the initial wealth distribu distribution in this kinds of models. So, if it does not happen, then you will have to that gives you a pointer as to the direction in which you got to extend the story. Okay? So, long as there is no strong connection between cost of fighting and initial endowment, this is going to happen. So, what are the contexts in which it is not going to happen? What are the contexts in which fighting will be inequality enhancing rather than equality enhancing? The context where there is typically a strong credit market kind of linkage, where your initial endowment gets reflected into higher conflict efficiency. If fighting is more about pure muscle, you do not really need money, pure muscle, then it is going to be the other way around. So, now you can see that you can split it up into different kinds of fighting, capital intensive battles, capital intensive conflicts and labor intensive conflicts. So, long as conflicts are labor intensive, they are going to be equalizing. And if you value equality and if there is no other way of, of redistributing, you might even uh, be willing to accept some conflict. But if, if, if the fight cap fighting technology is largely capital intensive, if electoral battles happen, if elections are won, primarily through mobilizing people in the streets, then the consequence of electoral political conflicts may be equalizing. But if electoral battles are primarily determined by how much money you can spend on ad campaigns, it will be disequalizing. Hmm? And if the both of them come together, it depend, depends on the relative strength of each other and then, uh, then, then you run regressions and figure out whichever is stronger. Right? That is the way to think about this. Clear? Any other question? Okay. So, that is the paradox of power which you see uh, realization of this, where what did we do earlier? We kept life simple by just looking at scenarios where the there was some resource given from outside over which you fought. So, it was like suddenly this country finds new petroleum reserves and social conflicts break out over which ethnic group wants to control this. And this happens all the time in uh, multiple countries. But now, I, I can think of a, a more general scenario where what we fight over is what we produce. So, property rights are imperfectly defined over our own production. So, the resources that we have most easily uh, uh, conveniently think of it just as labor, ability to work, labor power. So, we have some labor power, some effort. We can use that to produce stuff, food. And what we want to consume is really food. But if we do not set aside some of our time and some of our labor power to defend what we produce, all of it will be stolen. Similarly, if the other guy does not set up any, any military class to defend what it does, I am going to go and steal the other guys, the other guy's stuff. So, now you have what is called a production versus expropriation model. Now, my economic decisions have to do with how to allocate my resources, whether money or effort between production, which is good, which actually adds to stuff versus stealing, robbing, which does not in and of itself adds to stuff. How does it generalize the uh, 
relate to the earlier stuff? Well, there the benefit from fighting the rent that was exogenously given, right? It was just there. Oh, well, like I said, a whole bunch of diamond mines just came up and we're fighting over it. But now, how much we fight over depends on, or, or rather, what we gain from fighting depends on how much we fight. Because the more we fight, the less we produce and therefore the less there is to fight over. So, the, the decisions become uh, intertwined. And what kind of questions does this let, let us ask? Is it really the case that if we see more fight, we should see more fighting in poorer societies? There is a standard idea, right? That uh, why is there so much fighting in place X? Oh, because this, this place is poor. Is that intuition correct? What happens? Do we do we do we do? Uh, should we expect conflicts to go down if there is greater prosperity? In other words, what is the connection between general economic advance? Uh, 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 general economic. Uh, economic success and conflict. And just to fix the intuition, you can immediately see that what I am going to drive the model is towards the idea that it is actually ambiguous. Why is it ambiguous? Because if I am in a richer society, what does that mean? Typically, it means that not always, but typically that people can make more stuff if they try to produce, right? So, the opportunity cost of fighting is higher, but in a richer society, there is more money. So, there is more to fight over. So, the gains from fighting is also higher. So, the cost of fighting is higher, but the gains from fighting are also higher. So, therefore, it is not at all obvious that a tighter labor market or employment generation, greater employment generation is going to reduce conflict. And that is that's, that's the second kind of policy, policy inside them I am driving at. You see this all the time, right? People talk about conflict, civil war, uh, crime and everybody sooner or later starts saying that, aha, bhai wo nokri nahi hai na, easy liye log itna market karte hai. What is the policy implication? Generate jobs. It does not work. Does not work in the sense there is no theoretical, obvious, logical reason why there should be a one to one correspondence between the two. It may work out like that in practice in certain contexts, it may not. So, now this is driving you towards in terms of your own research. Well, think of particular conflict scenarios that you want to look at. There are standard ways of doing empirical work. You look at measures of conflict, number of people killed, number of act, number of uh, incidents of conflict, all kinds of conflict data sets, uh, communal riots, whatever kind of conflict, uh, Maoist insurgency, Northeast insurgency, whatever kind of conflict you want to look at. You, uh, there are uh, on your as your dependent independent variable, you look at different measures of opportunity cost of conflict and prosperity. You run your regressions, do it well and you, you may be able to say something in the context of particular conflicts, but what the theoretical model will tell you is that you should not expect a general strong relationship either way. Okay? It can the the relationship between more prosperity and more fighting is actually far more ambiguous than, than is realized because of these two contradictory effects. So, let me just walk you through the model. So, uh, the agents can produce some output with the resources they have left after fighting. Uh, so, the production function I have a simple linear technology constant constant returns to scale, I can typically work with more complicated 
production functions does not matter for my purposes. So, this is the amount of resource that you have left after fighting right and this is my uh, 1 over a sub i is just the marginal product ok. The marginal product can vary across um, across, of, uh, across the agents. So, a, a sub i is just a productivity coefficient the inverse of that is the marginal product clear. So, the total price that is being contested over is simply the total output. This is a case where there is absolutely no property right exogenous property right enforcement in society. Think of a world where whatever is produced is up for this is this, this is this is the standard uh, standard kind of nomadic societies where everything you produce is open to rates from the neighboring tribe. You have to defend it and also you try to get your resources from raiding the, the uh, other tribe. More complicated versions I will have some proportion of the output is can be endogenously enforced some proportion is up for grabs. So, that is your uh, total output conflict success functions are as before and I will take the special case where they are uh, equally efficient because why do I do that? Because now I want to put some an additional channel of asymmetric in asymmetry in conflict in the model that will be through the through differences in cost of fighting. How are there differences in cost of fighting? Notice that the two players can have different different productivities. The, their productivity of their labor or their military expenditure in terms of stuff goods can be different, but then that is nothing but differences in the opportunity cost of fighting. So, I have already built in the asymmetry into that model through that flow. So, then why bother with z at all right. So, I will put z standard standard modeling suggestion always work with the simplest formulation that you need to tell your story you are not I often hear this from lots of students, but sir that is not realistic the model is not supposed to be realistic model has nothing to do with realism. You are not trying to define reality in a model you are trying to isolate some key features of a particular scenario trying to think through the implications of, of those elements. So, the simplest structure you need to tell your story the better. The shorter a short story usually the better a short story is right same thing holds for models. Once you once you write up the model and once you send it to a journal chances are that uh, you will get like n number of rejections and every time the referees will keep telling you up n a k a one a k a then then you throw in this completely unnecessarily generalizations eventually you may end up with a usually complicated model, but that is not how you start with that is what you do to humor the referees, but that is not how you train yourself to write the model ok that is that is an aside. So, now again uh, just like what you did earlier work your way through the optimization problem you get the first order condition you uh, end up with the relative conflict expenditure what do you get? The combatant who is less productive in remember that the inverse of those A's is nothing but the labor productivity coefficient. So, the combatant who is less productive in stuff in producing stuff producing goods producing food whatever is per unit of the non military resource gets the larger share of the output generated why because the cost to fighting is lower for the less efficient person. Why is it that throughout history the most successful uh, conquering groups the most successful uh, conquerors 
have come from extremely low productivity areas, Mongols, Genghis Khan, all the invasions from Central Asia, Turkmenistan, in uh, even start with Greece, Sparta, uh, hardly any, anything actually grew in Sparta, Macedonia, Alexander's area, Macedonia is even now the poorest part of, part of Greece. Why is it that the, the mountain tribes, the tribes from the steppes, the hill tribes, people from poorer areas were typically always destroyed much richer settled civilizations? The cost of fighting were much lower, comparative advantage in fighting. And there are the other stories, of course, they were physically hardier till like 50 years ago. Throughout the world, mountain people and people of the steppes had a significantly higher life expectancy than of plains people. It is a natural, uh, natural uh, advantage, health advantage, which is only in recent years has that been um, overtaken by improvements in medical uh, resources. That is part of the cost to fighting is lower for the less efficient person. Why is it that throughout history, the most successful uh, conquering groups, the most successful uh, conquerors have come from extremely low productivity areas? Mongols, Genghis Khan, all the invasions from Central Asia, Turkmenistan, in uh, even start with Greece, Sparta, uh, hardly any, anything actually grew in Sparta, Macedonia, Alexander's area. Macedonia is even now the poorest part of, part of Greece. Why is it that the, the mountain tribes, the tribes from the steppes, the hill tribes, people from poorer areas were typically always destroyed much richer settled civilizations, the cost of fighting were much lower, comparative advantage in fighting. And there are the other stories of course, they were physically hardier till like 50 years ago, throughout the world mountain people and people of the steppes had a significantly higher life expectancy that of plains people. It is a natural, uh, natural uh, advantage, health advantage, which is only in recent years has that been um, overtaken by improvements in medical uh, resources. That is part of the output generated and therefore, the has the higher consumption. The lower the relative productivity of a combatant, higher the share. And since the only way to eat is to fight here, the less efficient you are in generating food, the more you get to eat. This is the paradox of power in its starkest form, right. So, this is where the connection happens between your opportunity cost of fighting and your, your fighting success. So, Now, now I then get the total output and you will find that total output has this form. So, uh, what happens to output? If mean productivity rises, what is mean productivity? It is just the average of 1 over A 1 plus 1 over A 2. If that rises, total output is going to rise. That is obvious, right? If uh, on average, the parties are more productive, total output should rise, given its spread. The, if the spread changes, then it depends on which direction the spread changes, it becomes a bit more complicated. But given a spread, that is the absolute gap between the in output between the two parties remains the same. It is just that the productivity rises by identical amounts. Total output rises. What happens to total combatants total income, if a productivity rises, 
it is ambiguous. I want you to just work your way through it and this can again give you some research ideas. If my productivity rises, you can have a paradoxical result. I may be worse off because I am more productive. Why am I worse off? Because if I am more productive, I produce more obviously, but that means my incentive to fight falls. I become softer. Conversely, the incentive of the other guy to come and steal from me that rises and the two effects contradict each other and you can tweak around the model to have scenarios where I am act you have the paradox I am actually it is bad for me to become more productive ok my total total consumption falls. It depends on the relative uh, rel the relative rates. So, you got to have some structure to say something you got to have a structure one typical way of doing this is mean preserving spread. The average remains the same the spread increases you will have one set of results spread remains the same mean increases that is the absolute gap in productivity remains the same the but both productivity levels increase by the same amount. And you can have more complicated changes in schedule depending on exactly how it changes you can have different results that is another research agenda right there. You look at how productivity changes try to fit it into some kind of a story of mean preserving spread or different kinds of technological improvement agricultural technology. You have different kinds of agricultural technology irrigation facility increases I can model it in terms of different kinds of changes in my productivity that will have different kinds of impact on conflict. Death. Because death or debt? No, death. Death as in death. Huh. You might die. In that case, the calculation about higher consumption to expropriate. Ah, 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 ah. So, if I die, then that is uh, that is already captured in the probability thing. So, if I die, I get 0. So, you know, that is where I lose. Why not? I am risk averse. I am sorry, I am risk neutral. It also increases social conflict. This is the point I started out with, and I want you to formally uh, prove this. Basic derivations are all, all the steps are already there in the just complete the derivation. So, what happens to social conflict when a co society becomes richer? I do not know. There are contradictory effects going on there depending on the exact nature of improvement in productivity social conflict may go up or go down that is because I put it more simply it is more costly for me to steal, but there is more for me to steal. The opportunity cost of stealing or fighting is higher from for me, but in case I, I try to steal there is more to steal. Now, I have given you a whole bunch of uh, examples and applications of this. One application is look at crime rates in UP. Western UP is much richer than Eastern UP, but Western UP is also far more crime prone than Eastern UP. Why? I have given you a, a newspaper item there, which is actually very nice discussion of what is going on there. Part of the story is A, Western UP there is more to steal and B there are large periods of enforced idleness because, uh, because in sugar cane there are periods when you work a lot and there are periods when you do not need to work at all. And also sugar cane has been becoming less and less labor intensive. So, now you have the two effects working in the same direction there is more to steal and the opportunity cost of not working joining gangs that also falls because of technological change. You end up with much higher crime even though Eastern UP is much poorer than Western UP. That is the kind of story you can model you can run regressions with this kind of analysis. Yeah.
Oh, absolutely. Perfectly possible. No. Perfectly possible. So, what do you do in a regression analysis or how do you analyze these things? You have something you want to explain, right, which is your dependent variable, right. On the right hand side, you have a whole bunch of variables which are your independent variables which you think have an impact. You run your regression, you, the regressions can be fancy, uh, fancy can be basic and whatever. And your set of results will typically give you significant coefficients on multiple variables. You will hardly ever have any kind of regression analysis where only one vari uh, variable is a significance coefficient. In other words, explanations are always, almost always multi-causal. All that regressions empirical work does is, it identifies factors which are non-insignificant. Non the model will tell you this is an, this is a significant thing. This way. So, the test of this will be whether the regression coefficient is statistically significant, right. There may be 37, 47 other, other coefficients which are also significant. There typically will be. That typically is in every empirical analysis. That's irrelevant. That's not what one does in a in any any kind of empirical work. One does not look for monocausal explanations. Social science is not about monocausal explanations, right? So the uh, empirical work is always about figuring out which particular aspects are relevant. This is one relevant aspect. Your regression result might tell you uh, uh, about uh, the kind the kind of story you just read. There, uh, then that should also be, th there should be a way to test whether that story is also important. In which case, I will need to throw in some proxies of reporting versus non-reporting on my right hand side. Those proxies can simultaneously be significant. In which case, I will say that if both are significant, I will say that both these things are important in the sense that both, both these are explaining part of the outcome. Which one is more important? Well, unless like there is a, uh, there is like a huge difference, that is not really a very interesting question to ask. Because in terms of policy intervention, you will always have multiple channels through which things work and multiple channels through which you have to Im impact. So, and that is, it is not the purpose of any kind of analysis, whether sociological analysis or economic analysis to identify each and every channel in the same, same model, it cannot. Then you will not have a model, all you have, have is chaos, okay. Clear? Any other comment? Okay. So, um, so that is one kind of illustrative application. Why do we observe fighting? And just to fix your ideas, fighting is inefficient. Why do we observe fighting? We observe fighting for the same reason that we observe any kind of inefficiency. The strikes are inefficient, extended uh, uh, negotiations, arguing is inefficient, domestic violence is inefficient, uh, any kind of uh, lobbying activity is inefficient, voting is inefficient. All these things are inefficient. Why? Because in a world where these all uh, these things all require real resources, and if we in a world of perfect information, we will all know the outcome, and with zero transactions cost, we'll just look at the outcome that we arrived at after all this fighting, voting, elections, and everything, and we'll just uh, somehow decide to hit that outcome directly. I mean, if we knew the, the outcome of a strike to begin with, why should we want to actually go through the strike? We will just we'll say that, look, let us just decide to have this outcome, this split, this wage increase or whatever. And since transactions are costless, 
will end up with a costless enforcement and will save on the resources that we wasted in fighting. So, fighting occurs for the exactly the same reason that other forms of economic inefficiency occur. High information, transactions cost of negotiations, inability to enforce contracts and basically all these lead to a scenario where either I do not know important aspects of the environment, so I miscalculate or I know everything, but I cannot credibly pre-commit to not taking advantage of you not fighting me. So, if I cannot credibly pre-commit to not taking advantage of your good behavior, you have no incentive to stick to your good behavior. Right? So, we end up fighting. I will just give you a couple of examples and then I am going to stop for lunch. Classic statement of Marx's theory of revolution, you must have all read this, come across this at some point. So, social production of their life, men into enter into different relations that are indispensable and independent of their will. Relations of production which correspond to a definite stage of development of their material productive forces. Some total of these relations of production constitutes economic structure, real foundation on which rises a legal and political superstructure, blah, blah. This is all pretty well known, but what is important for my purpose is exactly this. At a certain stage of their development, material productive forces of society come in con conflict with the existing relations of production or which is but a legal expression for the same thing with the property relations within which they have been at work hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters, then begins an epoch of social revolution. So, what is Marx saying here? Right apart from the Hegelian phraseology which unnecessarily I think always think unnecessarily complicates matters. Basically, you have a certain kind of property distribution supported by this whole set of legal, legal, uh, legal structure. So, you have a whole bunch of laws which gives you a whole set of uh, control over pro property. And these ways of these kinds of property distribution, because of certain changes, historical changes, primarily changes in technology there arises a tension in the sense that the technological the technology the best practice technology cannot be used because of the way property rights control over productive things is distributed think of land one can argue that under feudalism feudal control over land makes it very difficult to have productivity gains because of the way production is organized under the feudals. The socialists would argue that under capitalism, this decentralized private ownership of capital leads to economic inefficiency. So, advantages of planning cannot be implemented. It is the, that sense in which property rights, the nature of property rights become a constraining factor on economic growth development of, of technology. Then begins an epoch of social revolution. Well, let us take the, take the case of socialist revolution. Let us take a very simple stylized way of looking at it. Let us say I, I assume that private ownership of capital means of production, factories, land, these are somehow wasteful in the sense because of private ownership, I cannot plan for the entire economy that leads to crisis, periodic economic crisis, overproduction and all that. So, if the workers took over all the factories and land and ran these collectively and through some process of 
of uh, management of collective management planning there would be a massive rise in aggregate output everybody could be in principle better off well if that's the case why do i need a revolution why can't the workers get into an agreement a contract with the capitalists the bourgeoisie if you like whereby the workers agree to pro keep providing the bourgeoisie whatever income the bourgeoisie was making earlier the bourgeoisie would be perfectly happy they are not losing anything and in return the bourgeoisie gave up their control over factories and land which passes on to the society at large or or factory level uh, workers management whatever whatever be your model of uh, of socialism if marx's argument is right that way we have productivity gains right the because of the binding contract the capitalists have nothing to lose they get exactly what they were getting earlier the workers get more so there is there is a surplus in fact the workers can even offer to pay the capitalists more so the capitalists should have a incentive to actually accept the deal everybody should be better off be strict pareto improvement why do you want a revolution it's according to his that marxist argument uh, there is no central planner in the first place so uh, how is that you don't need a central planner issue is not a central planner issue is contracts if somehow this relates this this is this relates to my earlier point if you could actually have a there was some way of having a credible contract which could somehow be enforced between workers and capitalists there would not be a revolution before the revolution, before the revolution. why can't you have a contract because suppose the workers say that they are going to pay the capitalists this amount is it credible it's not because once the capitalists turn over hand over the their control over the uh, capital and land the workers have every right it's a subgame perfect equilibrium the rational response of the worker is to renege once control is handed over by the bourgeoisie the workers don't have any incentive to stick to their stick to their contract on the other hand if the were the so if that is the case knowing that the capitalists don't have an incentive to voluntarily accept the contract anyway therefore you do not you cannot have a endogenous settlement of the issue therefore you end up with revolution presumably with this connotation of violence and force so that's one kind of one way of thinking about uh, this uh, marxist theory of revolution in this context when can you not have an have avert a revolution one scenario is what you have in mind when you have some third party guarantor some other country un which agrees to act as an impartial arbiter and enforcer of these contracts this actually happened in zimbabwe in zimbabwe when mugabe wanted land redistribution most of the landowners and were uh, white uh, settlers of british descent the britain actually acted as a guarantor so britain uh, agreed to uh, basically provide the money that would be necessary to buy off these landowners in zimbabwe and then give the land to uh, to the uh, the uh, Af the black uh, african uh, africans landless Afri Af africans as land redistribution the reason uh, you had a civil war uh, the reason you had a collapse of of the zimbabwean economy was then after that britain walked walked out because uh, because uh, the british government didn't really want to spend that kind of money so then the problem with this is what you see you have a third party guarantor but then who guarantor who guarantees the guarantor and so on so that's one kind of problem that's a that's 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 a diff that's a different argument that's a different argument i mean whether marx was right whether marx was wrong why marx was right 
I'll, I'll come to some of that in the, in the afternoon. But I don't really want to go into a whole entire exercise on marks on this. We can talk about this later, if you like. But I just want to make sense of a very basic question. Why do I need to go through all this violence and fighting and all that, which is supposedly associated with revolution? Just like, why do I have conflict? And essentially, it all boils down to one way of looking at it. It's contract failure. The other classic uh, example of this, which has spawned a huge amount of literature, is a paper by uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, which has to do with the question, why is it the case, why did Western countries extend voting rights? The uh, ad very few people, essentially the property owning males, had voting rights in the 19th century. Over a period starting from 1848, most European, West European countries expanded voting rights. So why did they do it? And the argument that uh, Asimoglu and Robinson are offering is that it's a commitment device. There was a, there was a genuine threat of revolution, in which case the rich would have been completely expropriated. So the rich wanted to give out a signal that they would be willing to engage in redistribution, which would avert revolution. But then how do you make that, co that credible? How do you make that promise credible? Well, one way of doing that is to voluntarily extend the franchise so that poor people get to vote. And if poor people get to vote, then in principle, if the rich do not redistribute, the poor people being voters, they can get into, get into place governments, which can then ensure redistribution. So this problem of contract en enforcement, in the absence of contract enforcement, you will have conflict violence. If you have a credible way of ensuring contract enforcement, then you would be able to mitigate the chances of violence. And their argument is that, by going for franchise extension, voting rights, generalized voting rights, the West was able to avert violent revolution. It's another example of what we have in mind. So let's stop here.